This episode of BJJ Mental Models is brought to you by BJJ Mental Models Premium. It's our membership subscription site for those of you who are truly dedicated to the journey of jujitsu and self-development. It'll teach you problem solving. It'll help you improve your learning and retention. It'll help you build a game plan and a lot more. You'll get access to unlimited black belt coaching from myself and other members of our community. You'll get access to a full community of black belts and other systems thinkers who want to help you succeed. If you're interested, premium.bjjmentalmodels.com is where you go to sign up. You'll get a seven-day free trial. No bullshit. Give it a try. Let me know what you think. If you like the podcast, you'll love BJJ Mental Models Premium. You can get it at premium.bjjmentalmodels.com. Give it a shot. Let me know what you think and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 135. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, we have a bona fide internet celebrity on the podcast with us. <laughs> we have Mr. Drew Weatherhead. Drew, how are you doing, sir? Not too bad. I appreciate the term internet celebrity because it sort of differentiates from a real live celebrity. And it's like this lower tier that is almost like a joke of a celebrity. And that's kind of how I see myself. I figured I had to couch it, right? But it must, it must be bizarre for you because in the world of the internet, you know, when you go on Instagram, like you're up there with more followers than like the A-list celebrity athletes in our sport. But in the real world, of course, you're Drew Weatherhead. I mean, I, I doubt people, I mean, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I doubt that you walk down the street and people are like asking for your autograph because you got all of these Instagram followers. You tell me though, if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, thank God so far. It may get to that point eventually. It's actually starting to sort of matriculate out into the universe in this very odd way that mm -hmm. that people will tell me that they know me through something when I don't know them or somebody will talk to someone I know and be like, you know, Drew, I know him because of this. I'm like, I don't know that person at all. And, and then sometimes it's even completely outside the jujitsu sphere. So I don't know. Yeah. The internet's weird, man. Like, like different degrees of separation are very strange when they happen. Yeah. I, it creates this kind of weird dynamic with people that you've never met before that I, you got to think probably didn't really exist to the same degree prior to the internet, right? You know, people are out there putting, you know, a really intimate profile of themselves out the public. You know, this show, for example, there's so much content out there if you want to listen to me or my brother prattle on. But most of these people who listen, I've, I've never met them in person, right? But they have listened mm -hmm. to me so much that it feels like they know me quite well. And similarly, you know, when I listen to podcasts, I have the same experience where I almost feel like I know these people just because I've listened to them speak so much, but I actually have, you know, they have no idea who I am. It's a very interesting dynamic. And I, yeah, I, I do sometimes get letters from people. And of course, you know, they're talking like we're best friends or, mm -hmm. or that BJJ Mental Models has changed their life. And it's always kind of weird for me to wrap my head around that, that we could have such a profound impact on someone's game when we, you know, we've never even met. So part of my mission in terms of what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to actually bring these people into the conversation so that oh, cool. I can get to know these people. You know, I don't want to just have a situation where I'm projecting my voice out there and people are listening. It's much better when people write back in and share their experience and we all kind of learn and grow together. Uh, but yeah, you, you got this discord that's doing that right now. Hey, yeah, it's uh, it's grown pretty big, actually, uh, which is a good thing. It's funny. We started our, our discord because we thought well you know this would be a great way for our community to get to talk but i didn't envision it kind of growing to the point where it has now and it's like now the the biggest challenge is like how do you monitor and manage all of this and mm. and thread it and keep the content bucketed in such a way that it's easy to find because there's so many people contributing now it's a good problem to have but it's it's funny it's one of those things that you know once you start putting this stuff out there you wind up with different problems than at the beginning right you know at the beginning you're thinking like oh man who why would anyone listen to me what i don't have enough content out there and then at some point you know a year or two later you're in the spot now where you're thinking oh well i've got too much stuff how do i organize it how do i onboard yeah. new people who didn't follow us since day one and i i'm sure that is a problem actually maybe this is a good opportunity for you to introduce yourself i mean you are a bona fide internet celebrity but people may not know exactly the extent of what that means why don't you give everyone just a heads up on who you are and what you've been doing Sure. So this is something that, depending who you're talking to, could be coming from 
a number of different places because I've used the internet for these types of broadcasts of either my personality, my humor, or my instructionals for a, a number of years now to the point that they don't always cross connect. So some people will know me more recently in like the last couple of years as an online instructor, but to really get out there, my, my main presence online is I'm the creator of uh, Because Jitsu, which is the largest meme, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu meme page on the internet. And so they would know, they would know the page more often than they would know me by name, if that's how they knew me. But I'm trying as much as I can to start cross branding those things together, as especially as I start getting my instructionals more out there. You know, I would like when I first started because Jitsu, to be honest, I didn't want people to know that I did it. Like it's it gave me some latitude to poke fun at things and people in a way that I didn't have to worry about like a personal backlash right away. Um, mm -hmm. but now it's gotten to the point that like you're saying, it is an industry standard It is the, the largest of its kind. So it becomes beneficial and, uh, obviously just the power behind it can really help my own presence now as an instructor, which wasn't my consideration when I started, I started when I was a purple belt, I'm now a black belt. Yeah, that's funny. Cause I, I mean, I know that in your case, you and my brother know each other quite well. Um, you and I have never met in person, but I, you know, mm -hmm. I'm familiar with you, obviously through my brother, I'd seen your name all over the place just because we, you know, we're kind of like connected on Facebook and, you know, you're a friend of my bro. And of course I'm familiar with because Jitsu, but I had no idea <laughs> that, that these two things were actually the same person. And I remember yeah. at some point I saw, cause you do a, a pretty good job of keeping them separate. And, you know, when, if you go on to because Jitsu, you would have no indication that this is by Drew Weatherhead unless you do some digging. And I remember at some point I- A little bit digging. Yeah. And I remember at some point I made that connection and I thought, holy shit, this is the same guy. So <laughs> it's just, just funny, like a, a local boy like you, you know, you're not too far away mm -hmm. from us. You're in Alberta, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So it's just, it's just interesting that you're, you've basically managed to dominate the internet and become one of the, the more popular. I, actually, I believe you're correct. The most popular meme resource on the internet. And at some point in the future, I'd actually love to explore that with you. Just the power of messaging through memes and memetic messaging. I'd love to talk about that. But I know that, like you said, the big thing that you're passionate about these days is online instruction and growing your profile as an instructor for the first time recently. Recently, I mean, I've noticed that you've been getting your name out there a lot. You have a lot of new instructional material coming out. You, you're building your own platform for online instruction. And clearly, this is a, an area of major passion for you. So, you know, at your recommendation, I'd love to maybe dig into your framework and your method for how you do that. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I'm actually, I've been excited about this podcast for a little while now, because this is the first time that I've really been able to, I guess, publicly put out there the framework in which that I've been working with as as a content creator and instructor of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu techniques. So it's not that there aren't enough people doing that out there. In fact, there might be too many at this point. I'm sure you'd agree. Mm -hmm. It's just everybody yes. and their dog with a camera is showing how they like to do, you know, X, Y, and Z technique. And it's you know, a lot of it is haphazard, to be honest. And I guess what I was looking for when I started doing it is when it started, it, it was it was kind of after the fact when it became obvious that I was going to, and this is a whole different story we won't get into now, is when I made the transition between a full-time job, I was a welder in the trades, to a full-time instruction and academy owner. When I made that change, there was, there was another change that happened that I didn't really expect or understand what the, the scope and breadth of this change would be. And that is the difference between being a student and being an instructor. Mm -hmm. So this was, this was where I first sort of accidentally kind of tripped down this path because, I mean, you don't necessarily have to do this. A lot of people don't, and I don't necessarily fault them for it, but you can just regurgitate what your instructor told you word for word verbatim. And if that's good enough and your, your students pick it up for what it's worth and that's all well and good. But what I started to do meaningfully, purposefully as I was instructing was not only showing the techniques that I've learned and that I've been taught, but I needed to start figuring them out to a different degree. I shifted my 
my focus of how to instruct from what I would consider a linear way of instructing, which is like A, B equals C, you know, it's just step by step. Or if we're doing a sweep, you put the grip here, the leg there, and then, you know, it's very linear, right? And, and I find that that type of breakdown is, it's, it's very base level of doing things, which maybe will help people that know absolutely nothing about jujitsu. They don't know what to do with any of their limbs, but it is less useful. And you hear this all the time from newer students when they have to do something live against a resisting opponent that doesn't let you get to B or C. You know, you have to actually mm -hmm. start understanding how to problem solve. And if you don't understand how to do that, it's like being asked to do trigonometry when you barely got taught arithmetic, you know? Yes. So then I shifted from the linear thought of the technique and broadened my scope to what I would consider, I'm using a video game tech terminology now, a sandbox thinking. So the difference between a, a linear game, if you're going to go from level one to level 10, and that's the game, then you just go from, from A to B and you're done. But the sandbox thing, if you think of like a Grand Theft Auto or something like that, you get to explore entire universes. You get to like decide what you want to focus on. You can spend the whole of your resources and time and expenditure on whatever interests you. And that's kind of how I've been looking at instruction because there's, there's things that I'm discovering. The reason why I started doing this was because I would show people a technique that made perfect sense to me. And the most common recurring question I would get from students of generally between white and blue belt level was the question, why? And this is something that isn't necessarily plugged into a lot of instruction, especially online instruction I'm seeing, is you'll get a lot of those linear techniques, single one-off videos that are like, ooh, this is a trick, that's kind of cool. But there's no real, like, deeper understanding of why, why it works and why you would do this, why you wouldn't, you know, that's that's a really powerful question that deserves a lot of introspection. So... The why, if it was something that I didn't understand why, which when I first started instructing was actually more than I expected. I, there was a lot of times when people would ask why when I was showing a technique where I was like, you know what? I'm going to have to get back to you on that yeah. one. I know, I know that it works. I'm just not sure why just yet. And I would have to, where I started unpacking and figuring out the why, if I just couldn't straight up find some sort of information on it, and sometimes you could, but often you couldn't, I would have to look at when I would use this technique in actual live sparring. And what I discovered is that when you're sparring, especially after you've had years and years of experience, so when you're like a competent grappler, whatever that means to you, when you're moving competently, what I found is that there's different types of knowledge besides just the straight up understanding of a technique. And in fact, I, I break it down in my own thinking in two categories. One is implicit knowledge. And that's the knowledge of the technique, like I was saying, like, this is how to do the thing, say it's a sweep. Or the second one, which is actually the larger category in my experience, is kinetic knowledge, which is it's understanding that the body has that has never fully been understood by the mind yet. Mm -hmm. And you'll do so many things. Like, think about any given role that you have, any sparring session in the gym, how much of that was thought out, even in the moment, a lot of it is reactionary and that reaction is subconscious. And there's a lot to unpack in that sort of after the fact, why did I do this? It obviously worked. Do I know why it works? And it's actually surprisingly easy to sort of reverse engineer what you did successfully in a role into understanding of, you know, concepts and techniques and heuristics that can broaden your understanding of the game theory as a whole. Yeah, yeah. This brings a lot of bells for me. I mean, I, I think we're kind of in the exact same camp here, and I definitely have experienced the same feeling. There's this very famous book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And in it, he says that there are basically two systems of how you think and how your brain works. There is the fast system, which is where you're basically 
doing things subconsciously, right? You know, you're, you've got the behavior so ingrained that you don't even need to think about what you're doing. And then there's the slow system, which is the, like the deliberative system where you have to really puzzle something out, right? Like, I mean, if I'm walking down the street, that's my fast system, right? I don't have to think about where my feet are moving. My body just knows how to do that. And then there's the slow system, which would be like, if you're doing your taxes, right? <laughs> you know, something mm-hmm. that you, you have to actually stop and use the cognitive part of your brain for. And the interesting thing is you can migrate knowledge from one part of your brain to the other. So, and that's actually a good part, a big part of what training jujitsu does. You know, we talk all the time about muscle memory. That's effectively what we're talking about here, right? When you take a day one white belt and you try to teach them an arm bar, they are going to be, and I mean, everyone knows this feeling, you are going to be so inundated with little details that you simply can't keep track of them all in your head, right? I mean, I remember Mm -hmm. that feeling of being the new guy on the mats and I'm thinking like, oh boy, like I put my foot here, I put my hand here. Is this a same side grip or a cross grip? What do I do? And it's just like, it's so overwhelming that you're basically paralyzed. I think we can all relate to that feeling. It's something that we've all had to experience. But on the other hand, you know, once you get up to black belt as you, or as you, even before then, as you train more, you start to move this stuff into your muscle memory and now you don't need to think about what you're doing anymore. And so what you're actually doing when you move something into your muscle memory is you're moving things out of the deliberative side of your brain and into the the fast side of your brain. You basically ingrained the habit so much that you don't even need to think about it anymore. Mm -hmm. And the process of doing that allows you to free up the cognitive part of your brain, right? So the day one white belt, they're having to use that deliberative, slow cognitive part of their brain to just think about where their hands and their feet go. But once you've drilled and and practiced that enough, that's now in your muscle memory and you don't have to think about that, which means the deliberative part of your brain can be thinking about things like strategy. And that's, that's probably the main difference in the mind of like a black belt versus a white belt, right? What's, what the white belt is actively thinking about is like, fuck, where's my hand? Where's my foot? Where's my head? Yeah. Whereas the black belt is thinking about how can I bait this guy into doing X, Y, Z? You know, how can I, if I want him to be in this position three moves from now, how can I reverse engineer that? And it just, it allows you to free up part of your brain. That process is something that Josh Waitskin talks about. He calls it form to leave form, where basically you practice the form enough that you don't need it anymore. And you don't need Mm. to think about it. But the flip side of this, right? This all sounds well and good that you drill something until it's in your muscle memory. But the flip side of this is once something is an ingrained habit, by definition, you're no longer thinking about it anymore. You're just doing it. And that could be real dangerous in some situations because you wind up doing things without thinking about why you're doing them. Yes. And that's very much an experience here that you brought up, which I have had as well. You know, when I started jujitsu, my instructors really took a, a very, you know, a very primitive approach. And most instructors still do this yep. where they're not really explaining why to do something. They're just having you parrot these steps over and over and over again. And they don't give you the context, like you said, about how is this going to work in a sandbox? They're just making it look mm-hmm. like it's this incredibly easy five-step thing that you have to do. But the reality is there's so many variables that could happen in a live role. And then people get frustrated when they try something because they can't actually apply it in practice. What I've found is like what you said, as a black belt, actually the best thing that I can do to make myself better is try to teach students because by teaching them, I have to stop and I have to actually ask myself, fuck, why am I doing this? Right. You know, cause, yep. cause if you're teaching someone, they, they might ask, okay, I, I see that you're putting your hand there, Steve, but why are you doing that? And what I'll often find is I'm doing it because 10 years ago, someone told me to do it and I started doing it and it became ingrained as a habit. And now I just do it and I don't know why. And when I stop and actually, when someone asks me, why do you do that? And I have to bring that out of my habits and back into the cognitive part of my brain and process it, I might realize there's actually no reason why I'm doing this. Or or maybe there is a reason why I'm doing this, but I'm not, it doesn't apply in every context. And so I find that process of teaching you know, being, being surrounded by white belts who ask you why, and then me be having to find out a way to answer that. It actually makes me better in a way that is almost more valuable than just putting time onto the mats at this point. Yeah, I agree. And you were mentioning the, the bad habits and, and asking why about them. What I find is even more common because as, as you become an expert level grappler, you have very, very few bad habits by that point because they've been forced out by attrition over time. But what you're going to find is that you've accumulated good habits that you don't even realize are there. 
And that's mm-hmm. where the real treasure trove is. Like you could, like you're talking about drilling a technique until it's muscle memory. When you're doing that, mostly all you're thinking about is the one, two, threes technique. And you're just hoping that that works into your sparring. But really, that's not how it works in sparring. You have a lot more of a kinetic feel against a resisting opponent that you don't get from typical drilling that I think can be unpacked afterwards and be, you, you can get bigger truths out of it is what I'm finding as an instructor. Yeah, yeah. The the unpacking of good habits is something that, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of good habits exist not because we were told to do them, but no, because... No, many of them. Yeah, but just because through years and years of facing resistance, we just develop these things, right? You know, if... if yes, it's data chunking. Yeah, exactly. Like if you put your head in a place and you get choked, and then you do it again and you get choked, after about a dozen times, you're going to start to just intuitively understand where your head should not go. That's right. And then years later, you're just going to find, even if you've, this is a thing that we talk about a lot on the podcast, right? We talk about alignment, which is a framework that we get from Rob Bernanke. And, you know, we use this terminology. And a lot of the time when we talk about it with people who aren't familiar with it, they say, well, what is it? And then we explain it. And if they're competent at jujitsu, they'll realize, oh, I've been doing this all along, even though I didn't know what this framework was. It's just, if you have been presented with resistance and, uh, you know, someone attacking you for long enough, then your body will learn to find good alignment because you don't want someone to rip your arm off or rip your neck off, right? That's right. You you data chunk the pros and cons subconsciously as much as consciously, even more. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, to get back to my actual filming now of instruction. So this this whole process that we've been talking about so far basically describes my transition from trying to turn from the student into the instructor and taking on the mantle that that incurs when it comes to unpacking and and really understanding why people do things so that the reason why I do that is not only because it's endlessly interesting to me. This is like I said my my number one focus and passion is this because it's so just incredibly interesting as, as, uh, I sort of rediscover my own passion, mm-hmm. but turning that into the instruction when it be either I'm, I'm instructing students in class or for filming, which is actually, I, I do both simultaneously when I am instructing is I just film it because I figured out along the way, like, why am I not filming my instruction during class? Mm-hmm. Cause it, it's happening anyways. And, you know, it takes so much more time out of my life to do it after the fact at a, you know, a different time in a studio environment. I just, I'm just going to capture it as it happens kind of thing. And it's, it's actually provided me with tons and tons and tons of content. But the goal of understanding all of these things broadly is so that I can present it to people in a way that is short, simple, and concise. I'm trying my very best to to do all of the mental heavy lifting myself in the background so that I can refine it and purify it into its simple, most efficient way of I, I'm trying to transmit my thoughts into somebody else's brain. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of white noise that can happen in that process if you aren't cognizant of that. And so my one of my major goals is is efficiency of words. I don't want to be talking for 10 minutes about one technique. The, nobody yes. nobody pays attention to that. They just can't. And we could talk about other instructors that that take literally 10 hours <laughs> in, in a series to go over a, a single concept. Oh gee, I I wonder who you could be talking about. What what famous instructor? Yeah, who could I talk about? It's probably Mackenzie Dern, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, but th- that that aside, I'm not saying there's no value in that. There's obviously a ton of value in that, but In my own experience, I find that I can transmit what I'm trying to most efficiently and more importantly, to the broadest possible recipient base by keeping it short, simple, concise, and trying to have maximum efficiency of words. And my framework that sort of guides how I do that, and I I try not to have an instructional video or technique I show any more than two to three minutes max. Yes. Is I try to think about before I do the technique, I obviously know how to do it beforehand, but the transmission is what's important to me. And I think about the what, the how, and the why. And I think that a lot of instructors stop at the first two. They Mm -hmm. say the what in armbar, the how, step A, B, C, now you're in an armbar. 
But then what we've been talking about, which really adds the value and the color to the picture is the why. And if you can add all three of those things to a given technique in a short amount of time with an efficiency of words, I find that people across the board get the most value out of that. That's been my experience. So it's funny you bring that up. I mean, there's, oh man, there's so many parallels there to unpack. On the topic of the what, the how, and the why, I am always kind of shocked at how many instructors don't go into the why. At this point yeah. in time, after d doing this podcast for as long as I have, it's really changed my thinking in terms of how I present information. And now when I teach, I mean, it, it's been a long time since I've taught just due to the pandemic, but mm -hmm. now when I teach, I almost exclusively focus on the why. I mean, I can do a whole hour and a half class and teach that without showing a technique, right? Like there's, I focus instead on showing people concepts and letting them figure out how the techniques that they're familiar with are just illustrations of those concepts in motion. Mm -hmm. And I think a big part of why instructors don't teach the why, I mean, there's a few reasons. One is just the reality of the fact that most jujitsu instructors, as you mentioned, they're not trained teachers. They, what they do is they train jujitsu a lot on an individual basis. Yeah. And then one day they find themselves on the other side of the class where they have to teach and they just mimic what their instructor did. And so they wind up basically just passing down this kind of like these tribal methods without really ever questioning them. But I think another thing is cognitive dissonance, right? If you start talking about the what and the how, you're just giving people instructions. But if you start talking about the why, you may encounter a situation where you don't have an answer. That's and that's, right. almost, that's almost like an existential crisis for a black belt, yep. right? I mean, you, you got to think about what that's like if you're, if you're not familiar and you've never been in that role, right? You know, imagine you're a black belt. You've got this stupid piece of cloth around your waist that makes everyone expect that you're this font of knowledge that can answer anything. You go up in front of the class. A white belt asks you why, and you can't answer right? That's cognitive dissonance to the max, right? Because yeah. now you're on the spot and you're, you're feeling if you're, if you're attached to your knowledge and you're attached to your rank, your feeling is that you're going to be like a fraud because you can't answer these fundamental questions. And so I think for a lot of people, it's easier to, to say what it's easier to say how, but if you start to say why, that opens up a lot of questions about how much do you really actually know? And that can be tremendously uncomfortable for a lot of black belts. Yeah. Can I give some advice to people who find themselves in that situation? Because like I said, I, I found myself in that situation, had to wrestle with this myself. And it wasn't a smooth transition at first. I'll tell you that. I make it sound smooth because I'm just abbreviating years worth of effort. <laughs> but my my suggestion, looking back retrospectively, if I were that brown belt, which I was when I started my gym again, and I ran into that first or second time when somebody asked why, the immediate idea or or reaction that you want to have is you have to give them an answer. But mm -hmm. if you don't have an answer, that's the worst thing you can do. In yes. fact, what you should be doing is just going, hmm. I'm going to think about that and get back to them later. Like actually think about that and get back to them later. There's nothing more your student is asking for. They're just asking for the answer. They're not demanding that you have it right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the ability to perform is a tremendous amount of pressure on everyone, but especially the instructor, right? We have this feeling that if someone asks us a question or they ask us an answer that we are now obligated to provide a response. And that often results in people winging it or people being put on the spot and feeling like they must answer. But like you said, you don't have to, right? It is the, it is really the fundamentals of humility that you learn to just say, I don't know that. And that's okay. Yeah. Right. I mean, I remember when I started jujitsu, I had this impression that if you were a brown or a black belt, that basically meant that like you knew everything and you could, you could call your shots in a roll. Like, you know how, like when someone is yeah. playing pool and they're like eight ball in the corner pocket, I assumed that that's what being a brown or a black belt meant that, you know, I could just say like, I'm going to arm bar you from guard and it's just going to happen. But I didn't realize. And what I realize now is no, it's actually not about that. It's more about the strategy of getting people into the things that you're good at. And, and mm -hmm. it is normal 
for a black belt to have to not be a black belt in everything, right? I mean, even within the context of jujitsu, I mean, myself and as an, an example, if you were to ask me to list off like every common position and technique in jujitsu and like rank myself based on how good I am at that, there's going to mm-hmm. be a lot of areas where I would give myself an F because I know that I'm just not the guy who does that kind of stuff. And that's okay. And having that beginner's mind to accept that it's okay to not have the answer to everything and to not feel obligated on the spot to just conjure something something up. That's very important. I remember the first time someone did that where I was having a conversation and I just sort of felt like, you know, everyone has to have an opinion on this. And I asked someone a question and they came back and said, I I just don't know enough to answer that. I remember it really blew my mind that that was an option that you could provide is to just say, Mm -hmm. I am, I do not know enough to be able to answer that. So I choose to say nothing. Yeah. Can I go one step further? I'm going to sort of put myself out on a limb here. This uh, give a hot take is not only would I say that me and you, we don't know everything about jujitsu, but I'd go so far as saying there isn't a single person on planet earth that knows everything about jujitsu. In fact, name your, your prodigy black belt who's the greatest at blah 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 they are not the greatest at every single part of the game in fact there has to be some part where they're deficient and i think that that's awesome i think that that's exciting it means that you can specialize in something and you can broaden your understanding of other things for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. yeah i think that the best way to think of what a black belt really is like i like to think of it and approach the method similar to what, you know, if you have a doctorate in something, right? I mean, which is which is not to draw the parallel between the two. I mean, I know that people like to say that ha- having a black belt is like having a doctorate. It's it's not. <laughs> They're very different things. But let's use this as a comparative example, right? If you have a doctorate in something, like if I have a doctorate in you know, physics, that does not mean I know every single thing about physics, right? It doesn't mean that you can just come to me and ask me any question about any wing of this and I can just off my head give you the perfect response. What it means is I have made a unique contribution back to this to this field, right? Like I have, yes, I've taken the courses. I have a base understanding of most things, but the thing that makes you a PhD is that you created a thesis. You carved out a very, very specific niche piece of knowledge. You identified something and you, you discovered a bit of knowledge that had never been known before. A very specific, very targeted, very particular discovery. It doesn't mean that you know everything about the field. It means that you made one specific new contribution to the field that withstood the pressure of putting it in front of a committee for review, right? That's what, what being a, a PhD means. That's how th- that type of expertise is evaluated. And so, you should you shouldn't assume that you know just because someone is has a phd in one particular field that therefore they know every single thing about that field far from it and similar with jiu jitsu it is totally okay to be like look my thing is single leg x guard and the strategies around that but if you come to me and you ask me about worm guard i'm i'm not going to lie yeah. to you and sit here and pretend that i have any idea what you're talking about but maybe we can figure that out together or maybe yeah. there's someone else in the class who has a better understanding right like it is it is imminently possible that you might be a black belt, but there might be a blue belt in the room who has a better understanding of one particular thing than you do. And you should not be afraid to marshal that experience and have them help you just like you would help them in other areas where you know what you're talking about. Yeah. You know, what's funny is I've done exactly that with exactly what you're talking about. I had a blue belt who did the whole Keenan Cornelius uh, worm guard encyclopedia, (laughs) lapel encyclopedia. It's always a blue belt. It's always a blue belt. It always is. I know. Yeah. And um, I exactly that I was like, show me all these guards, I want to see them because I don't know them. And we spent like several classes afterwards, just sort of like trial and error lab testing a bunch of shit, which was which was fun. And it is, it's important. I'm so glad that you brought up the topic of thesis, because it makes my next segue super easy. (laughs) (laughs) So Up to this point, we've talked about how I got into instruction, how I sort of fumbled down the path of of why and and how I I try to play things instruction wise as a a sandbox and do the heavy lifting behind hand or behind the scenes before presenting the, the most succinct version of it for public consumption. Now, I want to get into the actual heavy work, like what I'm doing in the background, how I personally sort of parse this stuff into my present current jujitsu thesis slash framework. 
Go for it. So you're going to find as I go through this too, that there's a, a uh, running theme of threes. And I, I blame school for this. They push that magic number three into my brain. And I don't know if the universe works that way or if it's just my brain, but there's a lot of threes. So I, I look at the, um, the whole of jujitsu as like a three power lens of focus, where if, if you were to picture like you have this device that you look through and you have three powers to the lenses. If you were to zoom all the way in to the third power, it is uh, what I call the micro of jujitsu. You pull back to the second power, it would be the macro and pull out to the widest view would be what I call the meta. So the micro, the macro and the meta. There's your three. What I consider micro are the tools involved in creating a technique or the ones that are necessary for doing what's necessary in a technique. For example, posts, frames, grips. These are tools. These are micros. These are things that are applicable throughout many, many different techniques. And there's going to be a lot of through line tools and micros that will apply all over jujitsu. And the more you zoom in on any given technique, the more you start to pay attention to those micros. The macro, what I would define as the macro, is the goal at hand. And this changes depending on where you are in the game. So, for example, the macro of, say, the beginning of a match when we're both standing is the goal is to figure out who's going to be the top player and who's going to be the bottom player. That is the macro of what's going on there. You can zoom in a little more on the macro and figure out like what is my goal if I just, if I want to force the top or what is my goal if I want to force the bottom. And there's a lot that can be said about the macro level. And then what I find is most interesting is the meta, which is the strategy or the game theory involved in any specific part of jujitsu. And if you were to, and I've had to do this a number of times, including with family members, describe what jujitsu is in the most broad sense to somebody who doesn't understand what it is. A lot of what you're going to be describing is the meta of the game. Not necessarily the strategy, although that's more important to the player. And that's very important when it comes to my instruction, uh, the strategy at the meta level. But you would say that you are going to try to bring an altercation to the ground in one way or another. You're going to try to control that person, whether it be top or bottom, in a way that leads, as Danaher would say, towards submission. That's basically the overarching meta analysis of the game theory. And then you start focusing that idea into whatever particular topic you're, you're talking about. And you can start to understand if the, the more broad you understand what your, what your focus is, then you can start narrowly focusing down from there into the macro of it. Say example, passing the guard, the, the meta strategy for passing the guard. And I can get into that in a little bit, but then you'd zoom into the macro is what is my goal for this particular type of control or guard that I'm having to pass. And then the micros, which are, you know, your, your grips, your pressure, your angle, your footwork, stuff of that matter. Uh, and, and using that thesis or framework has really, really helped me to to figure out the best way to not only understand what I want to transmit to people, but to do so in that succinct map fashion. It's funny you bring that up because when we talk to a lot of, you know, elite black belts on this podcast, they will speak in similar terms. So you're in very good company there where they will talk not so much about the grindy mechanics, like the thing that gets them excited is philosophical matters of jujitsu and big picture mm. ideas. And I think it is part of your development in jujitsu is this natural process of starting off thinking about the micro, like, you know, where do my hands go? Where do my arms go? And, and then, of course, eventually, once you internalize those ideas, you start thinking more about, you know, okay, what are the tactics that I'm going to use at the macro level? You know, how am I going to mm -hmm. get this guy to the floor? But then once you've really been around for a long time, even that gets internalized and you start having this, you start having to ask yourself questions about like, what kind of grappler am I? What What is jujitsu to me? What What kind of characteristics yeah. do I want to embody? And it becomes almost philosophical. We we model this a little bit on our website. We kind of break down all of the mental models and the concepts that we talk about into buckets. And I would say that, you know, they're 
there are mechanical mental models that you can use in jujitsu, right? Like I can sit here and I can probably talk for an hour about how the joints in the arm work and how you can manipulate those for maximal effect, right? And and that stuff is mm-hmm. important. It's very important to know. But what I find is white belts and blue belts are super interested in that stuff, like in the mechanics and like, okay, how can I, how can I rip this fucker's arm off? Like what's, yeah. how, what, what is the most conceptual way to destroy someone's alignment, right? And that, that is interesting and it's useful. But I find that for people who have been around the block a long time um, and the people who have succeeded at the highest levels, they tend not to be interested in that stuff anymore. They're interested more in the philosophy of jujitsu in terms of what it, you know, what it actually means as, as an art, as a form of expression, how it intertwines with how you build relationships with the people around you. Like jujitsu, when I started, you know, I probably would have described it as like, if you asked me, white belt, Steve, what is Brazilian jujitsu? I probably would have given you this diet tribe about how this dude named Hoyce locked himself in a cage and beat up everyone. And if you want a street fight, 95% of the street fights go to the ground. So this is what you want to learn. If you were to ask me now what Brazilian jiu-jitsu is, you know, depending on how how technical I want to get, I, I might start talking about alignment. But really, my, my one-liner, if people ask me, is I say, it is a vehicle for personal growth, which is an unsatisfying answer <laughs> in a lot of ways. It sounds like a cult or a, or some sort of so Ponzi scheme. <laughs> oh, dude, it, it, you know it's a cult. <laughs> well, well, I mean, let's be honest. Jiu-Jitsu is a cult in a lot of ways. But that's how I think about it, right? Like, if you strip away all of the stuff that you do in a daily role and you look at jujitsu over the the lifespan of a career, like someone who mm-hmm. does this for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, what is it? The thing that really matters is not whether you tap the dude at the gym. It is how you use this thing as a learning vehicle and a way to improve yourself over time. Mm-hmm. And I find that when you talk to really elite people, they, they all seem to take this approach. Like Robert Deagle was on the podcast giving his explanation of jujitsu and he was talking about how like it is it is the spirit of engagement. And when he grapples, he doesn't, he's not so much concerned about just wins or losses, but he wants to always be engaging because he believes that Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is like the spirit. It is a grappling art and the best Jiu Jitsu happens with the spirit of trying to engage with your opponent. And that's a lot Mm -hmm. different from the way that you would expect someone who's really good at this stuff to explain it. Yeah. Well, th- to be honest, that's something that I haven't even I-, I haven't even got to in this conversation yet. I have my own thoughts on that too, but I don't want to take your whole day up because we could get like <laughs> super deep on this shit. And I'm I would absolutely love to one time, but uh, I've got your uh, you know your time limits in mind as well as your <laughs> your audience's listening levels. There's I w- I want to give one example here of all three of these things sort of brought to bear on one particular topic because this is one that no matter what level of belt or experience you are is always happening in every single role and it is always interesting and and people want to know more about and that is the guard and when i say the guard it's it's like a two-sided coin it's either you're passing it or you're using it and that's so much of jujitsu so much of it is that dynamic and it's it's just a really interesting thing to sort of break down into this framework of the the meta and the macro and micro. And so if you were to think of the guard, the meta level of the guard, the way that I break this down, and I've gone into this on two different series that are available on my website because dash jitsu.com. I've got two full series, one on guard retention and one on guard passing, which are really, they should be like one series. It's just too much to put in there. And I didn't want to do that to people, but it is like showing do this if you're doing that and then make sure they can't do this if you're on the other side, right? It's it's very much just yin and yang of the same situation. But the meta is something I like to think about is if you look at the guard, if you had a player on the ground on their back with their legs up, it's a neutral open guard. There's been no connection yet. I look at the guard. And I'm not the only one to use this analogy as a red zone and a green zone. Everything in between their legs, I consider a red zone. Everything outside of their legs to either side, that's a green zone because obviously they Mm -hmm. can't use their guard outside of their guard. So the more you can take advantage of those green zones and manipulate your body into them is going to be beneficial to the passer. Now, there's 
I've broken it down into three different orientations of red zones and green zones. There's the one that I just described where somebody is laying on their back, basically like, you know, their chest is facing the ceiling and their legs are up and however wide they can spread it, that's a red zone. I call that a double green zone scenario because there's a green zone to the left and the right. And then if you were to tilt their guard so that one leg hits the ground, or if they did that, which is a very common way of using the guard, you think of half guards and open guards of that variety, Delahivas and such, there's lots of different guard orientations where you only have a green zone to one side and everything on the other side that they're trapping you in is red. Mm-hmm. Now, I, that presents two different scenarios. One is red zone passing. There are lots of efficient techniques to actually bust completely through all their best defenses, both legs and both arms towards that and crush them and pass their guard. That's red zone passing. Not the easiest, definitely doable. A lot of powerful passers do that. And then the other side of that exact same orientation is the empty green zone where they have no defenses. Their arms and legs are pointed completely in the wrong direction. That's always going to be the most efficient way to pass the guard. It's not always the easiest for you to set up as the passer to get there without them being able to follow. But there are, again, great passes and techniques to sort of funnel their reactions into a place that provides you an empty green zone to pass to. A lot of back exposure happens when that happens too. You'll see people turtle up because they don't want the pass and you take their back. That happens all the time in, tur- in tournament. So just understanding the meta of, of guard passing right there also plays vice versa. If you're on the bottom, understanding where your strengths and weaknesses are, depending on what orientation you're using your guard in. And there's, there's lots of simplification to both the top and the bottom that comes when you think about it in these ways. Then if you were to zoom into the macro now, we've gone over the meta, the game theory, the red and green zone, the macro. This is one that I've really focused a lot on just conceptually lately. And it's, it proved very, very helpful to teach this to my students back when I did. I have videos of this on my site as well, which is to be honest, this is easier to see than it is to explain. So I, I apologize if it's a little clunky in, in the verbal transmission. But what is the useful part of the guard? When you think about the actual, the guard is from the hips down. I mean, I, you can talk about the arms, which is sort of like your plan B defense, which there, there's a lot that can be said about the arms as well. But like 80% of the guards, I think you would agree, are, is the legs. From the hips down, what is really the most important, useful part of the guard? It's from the knee to the foot. If you were to chop somebody off at the knee and they had no leg from the knee down on either side, would it be a really effective guard? Could they stop you, like, at all? It's it's almost useless. What the knee to the hip does is actually it has an omnidirectional joint at the hip in that ball socket joint that points the useful part at the opponent which is from the knee to the foot. So when you understand that both from the top and the bottom, say you're the passer, your primary concern is controlling their leg, their from the calf, basically from the knee to the foot. If you can control that, stop them from being able to either lock and entangle you with it or direct it away from your body in a way that you can pass it without it being able to track you, that's an efficient pass. And that's going to be a through line no matter how you're passing. And then, of course, vice versa on the bottom, you want to make sure that that part is constantly stuck to your opponent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. This is something that on the podcast I've called the the three joint rule, which mm-hmm. is if you think about your limbs, right? The One of the defining things about your arms and your legs that makes them so powerful and so useful is they both possess these three joints of articulation, right? On your on your arms, you've got your, your shoulder, which is how it connects to your body. You've got your elbow, which is like a mid joint, and you've got your wrist, which gives you locomotive and dexterous abilities at the end of the, the lever. And then, of course, for your legs, you've got the hip, you've got the knee, and you've got the ankle and the ability to use all three of these joints in parallel is what makes these weapons so powerful right and it's like you said you know when the really the, the one of the defining characteristics of the guard like if you're going to ask someone what why does guard even matter like it is because you're in a position where you can use your arms and your legs in concert to attack right really mm-hmm. the only difference between having someone in your guard and having someone mounted on you is whether your legs are taken out of the equation or not, right? And having your legs available as weapons is powerful. And then, yeah, like you said, to the guy on top, you basically, it's very hard to lock someone's arm or leg because there's so many joints of locomotion. So you need to immobilize a lot of those joints and and at least two of them, I find. And I think that's Mm -hmm. what you're talking about here, which is like, 
if you lost that last joint, basically, or last two joints in this case, right? Like if you were chopped off yep. at the knee and you've only got one joint, which is your your hip socket, I mean, yeah, you could you could use your your leg as a frame, but you can't use it to clamp onto someone. You can't use it for hooks to track people. Your ability to use this thing as like a dexterous weapon is taken away. And yeah, similarly, if you're the person on top, especially against a good person, they're going to use the rotation and the movement of their joints so effectively and coordinated what you really need to do if you want to pass someone, if they've got their leg in your face, is you've got to start locking those joints in place, right? You have to make sure this fucker cannot move his knee, <laughs> this fucker cannot mm-hmm. move his 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 hip socket, this fucker cannot move his his ankle, right? And the way that you often do that is like leg drags are a great example, right? When you're doing yes. a leg drag, the whole purpose of that is you're basically trying to lock their hip and their knee socket so they can't use their foot because if they can't use their foot, they can't move their body anymore, and and that's a big part of of passing, and I think it's kind of it ties into what you're talking about here, which is taking these weapons and basically locking them in place so that you can go through or conversely going around to the green zone. Yeah, at least having autonomy over controlling where they are mm-hmm. more so than than your opponent does. So this is why one of my favorite grips to have when I'm passing is at the knee. If I can, if it's no gi, either cup right under the knee on the shin, or if it's gi, grab the inside or outside knee grips on the pants where they ruffle. Dude, that is a great way to control the guard because you have yeah. so much ability to manipulate that position from the knee to the foot over your opponent to to make them do something stupid that they didn't want to mm-hmm. do like you, yeah. you're going to redirect their their leg in a way they didn't want to just for a split second to sort of shuffle past it and man there's so many quick easy effective efficient passes that happen like that that has nothing to do with the person's guard sucks it's just mm-hmm. you manipulated it exactly the way that it doesn't work for the split second it took you to affect your pass yeah controlling them around the midpoint of the lever is usually a really good strategy, right? So if, you know, if your leg's in my face, if I grab you by the, like the ankle, you, you still have a lot of locomotive abilities. And that, that's a very much a common like white belt mistake is to try to like yes. grab someone's ankle and try to use that to Pin them, them to the floor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and similarly, grabbing you by like the hip is also dubious at best. I mean, because it's, it's just not a good joint of control. But if you grab someone around the midsection of the joint, like the knee or by the elbow, then you have some degree of control over all of the joints. That's why like arm drags are so powerful because you're basically like, if you were to try to arm drag someone with just the wrist, you're not going to have much luck. If you were to try to arm drag someone just by like copping their shoulder, not going to have a lot of luck, but it is Mm -hmm. the process of like manipulating their elbow that gives you control over the other joints as well. And it's the same for the leg drag. So usually I find when I'm setting up a pass, like if the guy on the bottom knows what he's doing, I'm probably going to have to deal with his hands and his feet first because they're going to be the first line of defense. But Mm. As soon as I can get past that through pummeling, yeah, I want to control the knee or I want to control the elbow. And that's how I set up my leg drags or my arm drags or my entries into something else. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple other macros that I probably just don't have the time to get into right now that if you're really interested, guys, to check out, I've got both videos on it on my member site, as well as, like I said, full instructionals on both passing and retention. Things to the effect of a concept I call outside knee position while passing, as well as slope of attack. Uh, Very important guidelines that all of these things I listened to the recent podcast with Danaher on Lex Friedman's podcast, and he, instead of using the word concept, which I think is a a really common way of of describing the same idea, he used the more, probably more apt and scientific word of heuristic, Mm -hmm. where it's, it's something that is essentially a rule of thumb that sort of cuts away a lot of the the possible options in a scenario down to the most efficient ones for the task at hand. So there's there's a lot of those things I go into in my other videos. And then of course if we were to now we've talked about the the meta of guard and guard passing the the macro and then the micro is like we were talking about those little tools that we're going to use if you're the top player it's the grips it's the control of vital guard portions it's the pressure it's wedges on the bottom it's mostly posts frames wedges levers hip adjustments these are all little things that can be sort of plugged and played on the fly when you understand what they're good for in a way that I've stopped 
trying to teach forms of guard. I'll I'll show them just as like curiosities when people want to know what they are, but I'm more interested in describing what is happening in this form of guard that makes it useful. So you could say single leg X or you could say De La Hiva, but what's more important are the tools that are being used and what their effect is on the person that you're trying to use it on. If you don't understand why you're doing what you're doing, again, coming back to the why, then if something breaks off in that guard and you don't understand what that now means, like say, for example, you've, you've got De La Hiva and, and your check leg, the one that's, that's range checking, not the hook, the other leg is pushed underneath their groin, right? Like somebody's going to go to a headquarters position. If you don't understand what that guy just did to you by putting your leg there, you don't understand the danger you just got put in for the sake of the utility of that guard. So you, you, you need to understand like, the, the micro is so important of not only knowing what tools are available, but why you even want them. And that will allow you to plug and play. And then you start to see these variations of guards, like a great user of, of guard variants in my experience uh, in research is Leandro Lowe. He started plugging several different types of people would say types of guards like like spider heva and stuff like that, where he would cross two different guards. But what he was really doing was just using different micros from each at at different times depending on what his opponent was doing that would change the effect of that guard yeah this is something we were just talking about with some folks in our community by the way if you want to brainstorm this with us on our on our discord we can always chat about stuff like this um, actually it's funny just the other day i was having a conversation with some of our subscribers and with preet mikkelsen about this and one of the things that we talked about was you know this this whole concept of like these various guards it's they're totally arbitrary, right? Like we talk yeah. about things like close guard, open guard, half guard, side control, as if these are like discrete positions, but they're they're just like labels that we agreed upon in terms of like, okay, if you have your foot here and here, this is side control. And what happens a lot of the time is people just fall back into these positions because that's what they're used to. That's right. And really, it's not like there's just you're in guard and then you're in half guard and then you're in side control. It's really like a whole, like it's a gradient, right? Like you can be anywhere along that process. And the problem that happens a lot of the time is like if, if I'm in bottom half guard and I feel like you're starting to have some success, right? Rather than trying to fluidly transition into or out of something else, I'll just be like, okay, well, I guess he's basically out. So it's time to play side control. And I just give it up. And then I sit on the bottom. Oh, I know. That was such a problem. Yeah. It, it has to do, I think, with the way that we're trained. We're taught that there are these quote unquote positions and it's like, okay, well, I'm losing my half guard. So I guess it's side control time. So people just let it go. But real guard playing is very, very fluid. And it's less about like trying to memorize, okay, which textbook position am I in? And it's That's more, right. and it's more about just understanding like, what are the principles and the mechanics of what I'm trying to do? And how can I just keep in good alignment? How can I have a good strategy this whole way through? That was a big breakthrough for me when I stopped thinking in terms of like defined guards and just started thinking about in terms of keeping body alignment good. That was a breakthrough for me because suddenly I was more fluid from these various transitions. Yeah, let me use half guard as an example. This is actually a really good one because people, like you were saying, half guard to them is a thing, right? Maybe there's a variation where you use a knee shield, but like you're, you're in half guard. But tell me, is there a name for when you post in half guard? There's, there's no, it's not a different form of half guard, but if you didn't realize that you could use that micro, that you could put a post underneath you, you wouldn't understand that you can change your position on the floor, Mm -hmm. And that changes the whole thing. The whole fucking thing changes at that point. Your retention skyrockets if you realize you don't have to defend half guard if it's indefensible. You can put a post on the ground, a frame against your partner, and move your hips a foot back. And now that changed their whole pass. It reset yes. it. Yeah. And a lot of the time we're so hell bent on duplicating moves because it's like professor taught me that when I'm in half guard on the bottom, I can do this underhook thing. So people are so hell bent on just following the steps that they don't bother thinking about, you know, from a conceptual basis, what's my body structure like? I mean, uh, again, another example I can give is up until around brown belt, I found it almost impossible to get out of side control. And I think actually probably this is a standard path of development for most people. Like when you're at a lower belt rank, side control seems like a kill shot. It's so hard to get out of it. <laughs> yeah. But but once you get to like black belt, side control is often not as scary as like mm -hmm. back mount or full mount. And 
the mistake I was making, it took me a long time to realize this. I would be on bottom and side control and I would try every technique under the sun to get out. And I knew all of the escapes, right? That that, all of the popular ones and they never worked. And it was so frustrating. And the breakthrough for me was realizing what's actually happening here is I'm thinking of side control as one thing, as one position that I have to play from. And so I would be like on my back with both of my shoulders pinned to the mat in a cross face. And I'd be trying to do these escapes. And I realized like, you're never going to get an escape off like that if the other guy has totally wrecked your alignment. My focus should not be on trying to parrot these moves that my instructor taught me. My focus should be getting to like a 45 degree angle so that one of my shoulders is not on the mat. And my focus should be on blocking the cross face. And my focus should be on just making little movements so my opponent cannot settle their weight. I shouldn't be thinking about escapes, but what the problem that happens is when when we drill side control escapes, we start from, okay, you're on the bottom, both of your shoulders are on the mat, now drill the escape. So you are what you drill at the end of the day, right? If I'm used to sitting down with Uki or Tori and I put my shoulders on the mat and I drill the escape 10 times, subconsciously I'm training myself that side control means both my shoulders go on the mat. And so what That's happens right. is when I'm actually sparring and you start to pass my guard, I just let both my shoulders go onto the mat because that's what I'm comfortable with because that's how I drill. But the big thing to understand more than any escape, like before you worry about underhook escapes or ghost escapes or anything, really the only thing you need to know about side control is don't let both your shoulders get pinned to the mat. That's don't right. let don't let the fucker cross face you and just keep moving just a little bit. You don't have to burn enough energy, but never let the dude settle his weight on top of you. If you do those three things, it's way easier to execute whatever escape you want to actually do. But if you're like totally screwed and you've got both your shoulders flattened, like no escape is at that point is going to have a high degree of success because your alignment is totally screwed and you're prioritizing the wrong things. So anyway, there's my TED talk on (laughs) how to escape side control. (laughs) I mean, again, that could be a whole podcast topic to itself. I'm sure it has been on here. Side control is one of those things too, that is uh, the better you get at holding it, it's maybe the best pinning position in jujitsu. I'll go out on a limb and say that, I mean, there's all sorts of varieties of side control, which which helps keep it powerful. You can sort of adjust as they're adjusting. But I, I remember hearing Keenan Cornelius say that at the world championship black belt level, if somebody gets him in side control on bottom, he'd rather give his back because it's easier to escape. <laughs> Yeah, I, I can kind of see that. I mean, side control has the benefit of gravity on its side, right? And mm-hmm. it it's kind of has fallen out of vogue because there are just so many powerful submissions from back. But the thing about having someone on your back is you can work in such a way where actually gravity is on your side, right? Even though you're the one who's given up your back, you can wind up being the person on top. And there's something to that because it makes it easier to turn and spin around and plant your shoulders, whereas side control... Being stuck in side control sucks because the guy on top has so much more mobility than you. They've got the benefit of gravity. They can just wear you down. And there's a lot of very viable attacks and transitions from there. So I I do not like being stuck in side control. Whereas interestingly, I mean, it's funny because probably if I were to plot it out, I get tapped a lot more often if someone gets to my back. But I'm more comfortable having my back given up than being trapped in side control all day. Definitely. It just is more comfortable, generally speaking. I mean, unless you're getting twisted up, but just like I was talking about, there's, there's two sides to the same coin with, with passing and retention. It's the same thing with side control is the more you understand how to prevent side control or escape it on bottom, you're, you're now the player on top. You understand how to stop them from doing that. So you're going Mm -hmm. to start twisting their spine out of alignment. You're going to put pressure in certain spots, which makes it near impossible to do exactly the things that you would do to get out. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a fun holistic game in that way and that's that's part of learning too is the better you get at one side of the same equation it will inform the other side just in the vice versa the last thing that i wanted to sort of touch on here to wrap up is i think that the final stage of instruction and i haven't got there yet myself because the sandbox is so vast and i'm having so much sort of new discovery all the time to to inform things that i'm not ready to sort of finish what i'm doing you know, like to put a, a, a finished version uh, of any of these theses or, or theories or hypotheses out there. But when you get to that point, it seems like the real power to all of this 
introspection and study comes in what is the most popular term in the world for instructionals right now, systemization. And I know that that's kind of a hot button word now that I feel it gets maybe misused more than it gets properly used. But what systemization should be in the purest sense should be the culmination of all of this pondering, musing, understanding, redigging through your kinetic knowledge and, and finding these heuristics and going through whatever framework works for you. For me, it's the micro, macro, and meta. It could be whatever framework works for you. But finally getting it down to a point of this is the most efficient way or the most efficient options for X. And these will be the systems that you'll see super teams like the Danaher Desk Squad. They have their system for everything. Their back system, their passing system, float pass system, their leg lock system, Kimura system, the whole thing. It's all systematized because they've got so much knowledge that has been honed down over hours and hours and hours and hours on the mat to this is the most effective, efficient way that we've seen at high levels to get to the final goal, which is submission. And I think that that's a super powerful thing to do. But there is also a problem with that, that brings this whole conversation full circle, is that if you are the student and you just start with a system, which is a finished product, and you never have to do any of the thinking outside of that, now we're back to linear thinking, believe it or not, which is super frustrating because you actually have like the cheat code for jujitsu. You have like this way of doing it best, but if you don't understand why, again, it's so important if you don't understand the why, then what you don't know how to use that thing in real time against a resisting opponent, and God forbid they do, your systems are mean nothing if you can't apply them in a malleable way against a resisting opponent, no matter what the situation. Yeah, it's funny you bring that up. I mean, the thing about systems is they they appear on their surface to be an answer to this challenge of just rote technique memorization, right? That's the idea in theory is, hey, you don't need to sit here and memorize hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of individual techniques, which you will probably fail to apply in practice. You can understand these systems, which is a more efficient way to learn and that's true. But what winds up happening sometimes then is people, instead of doing rote memorization of individual techniques, they will do rote memorization of these systems. Yes. So they're just replacing one problem with another. Like I always get a kick out of when I see these like BJJ flow charts and someone has like mm -hmm. taken the entire Danaher leg lock system and like made this ridiculous flow chart that like looks like one of those things in a beautiful mind where there's just like lines all over the wall. It's like, okay, you, you've totally missed the point in terms of what a system is supposed to achieve. You've made things more complicated. You've taken the benefit of a system, which is distilling and simplifying knowledge, and you've turned it into the thing that it was trying not to be. And maybe a big part of that is just due to the fact that, again, these instructionals tend to be too wordy, and really mm. we should be focusing on brevity instead of just more volume of stuff. But yeah, I find that that is a mistake that people make with systems, is they try to just copycat the systems and memorize every detail, which is the opposite direction of where you're supposed to be going. It's also important to understand that there's no rule saying that you have to copy these systems verbatim, right? Generally, if you're just trying to cookie cutter an instructor, you're going to wind up not kind of not being malleable, as you said, in, in your thinking. That's right. It's totally okay to create your own systems. You don't have to be John Danaher to use systems thinking, right? If you like, I don't know, if you like the Bravo choke, right? You can come up with a whole game plan based around that that's unique to you that, you know, even if you're a white belt, you can do that. And over the years, you can refine it. And then one day it might be something that's refined enough that you're comfortable sharing it with other people. But a system is not a, doesn't have to be a hard and fast rule where you just copy and memorize it. It should be a way of thinking and it should be malleable if it's a good and a robust mm -hmm. system. Yeah. And depending on who you're ascribing to, whether you come across it honestly yourself, or if you pick it up from a Danaher or a Ryan Hall or fill in the blank savant level instructor, uh, they can have different systems that answer the same question and neither of them are wrong and both of them are efficient, which is super encouraging to the student 
which again leads to this lifelong pursuit that you can find your own answers to. You don't have to be this cookie cutter like you're saying, which is important for the the other side of the martial knowledge, which people I don't think give enough credit to and which I try a lot to put in into my own instruction and, and give the reverence it deserves is the art. The art side of the martial art is super important. And it's uh, it shouldn't, I think you should never feel belittled if uh, you don't have a, a name in in the industry and you have different answers than the people who do. You know what I mean? Like, I think mm-hmm. that some people sort of undercut themselves or they don't try to put themselves out there because, you know, Dan or her has a back attack series. So why would I do something like that? You know what I mean? And I think that that is uh, a real roadblock to maybe some of the more, a lot of important art that isn't being shared. Yeah, I I agree. This is, I think, one of the downsides to having prestige-based systems like we have, where we award black belts and, you know, we put so much weight into, you know, what have you done lately for me in competition? I think the downside is that kind of creates a barrier in terms of allowing other people to contribute their ideas. And I, I mean, I get it, right? Because look, if you give me, if you give me a black belt and you give me a white belt and you ask both of them to teach me jujitsu, like there's like a 99% chance the black belt's going to do a better job of it. But that doesn't mean the white belt has nothing to contribute. This is actually something that I, I disagree with with some instructors because a lot of instructors will say like white belts should never teach anything. They should just shut up and listen to the black belt. Mm-hmm. Or if there's a black belt on the mat, everyone else needs to shut up because the senior guy's going to know the most. Well, that's not necessarily true, right? And in fact, it's kind of dangerous to think that way. I mean, yes, there is that that trope of the obnoxious white belt who thinks they know everything because they watched UFC a few times, right? I mean, yes, that does happen. I have trained with those people. It is always both funny and annoying to have to roll with those people where they're like, they've been training for two months and they think they know everything. And of course, if every white belt won't shut up about what they know, then you just get drowned in this sea of poor knowledge. That's true. But that doesn't mean that like white belts or really non-black belts, it doesn't mean that they have nothing to contribute. And we should not make these people afraid of sharing their thoughts and their ideas as long as they they couch them, right? I mean, as long as they're saying like, look, here's the limits of my knowledge and here's my thought, hit it with a hammer and tell me what you think. That's different from pretending you're like an expert when you're not. But we should always be willing to at least entertain people's ideas because they, there might be something to it, right? I mean, the example I gave on, I, that I've given on this podcast is, that, you know, the myth, I don't know if it's true or not, it probably is, is that Sean Williams invented Sean Williams guard when he was a blue belt. And he was supposedly in there with Henzo Gracie training this stuff. And they started working on it together. And I mean, this guy was in there with fucking Henzo and he's a blue belt and he's creating new guards, right? I mean, if, if Henzo's okay with that, then mm. I don't see why the rest of us can't listen to junior people too, if they're onto something interesting. Jiu-Jitsu is just such a big, diverse game that weird, novel, unusual things are always going to pop up. And if we if we assume that as as the ranking instructor, we know everything and we just don't allow anyone else to take up oxygen. I mean, you're going to wind up with a gym that becomes very authoritarian and culty, and that's not going to be good for long-term development of the art. Yeah, and it happens too often too. We could, I mean, I can think of a couple different specific affiliations that get pretty culty, but across the board, like it is, I feel like if there's one thing that I would like to have changed, not that I am going to change it, but something that needs to change just looking at the art as a whole is exactly that is is taking the the hubris away from the instructors or the affiliation or the lineage or whatever they they hang their hat on at the end of the day and just talk to people like people and and be honest with yourself you know that's something that maybe is lacking in in this art to a degree that i think would only make things more healthy over time yeah, it's funny. This is something that I I know Preet Mikkelsen talks about a lot, which is like, you'll get all of these people in the room doing jujitsu and they're all expected to pay deference to this instructor. Like they know absolutely everything, but it's like, you might have white or blue belts in the room who are like, you know, experts in kinesiology, or maybe they're experts in instruction. You know, maybe they've got like a master's in, you know, in education or something like that. These people could know way more than you about teaching methods or about the mechanics of the body. Yeah, they, they don't have as much experience breaking arms, but they still have unique areas of contribution. And so it's kind of funny when you've got some black belt sitting in front of the class 
pontificating on the right way to teach when they have no actual experience or education in that. Meanwhile, they're preaching to a choir of people who might actually be better at it than they are. So I, d- I do feel that we hide behind the black belt too much in, in this mm. art. And I would also say we hide behind competition record a lot too. I know that a lot of people are they're afraid to speak up if they don't have some like crazy world-class competitive record behind them. Um, I know that a common trope is if someone is trying to share ideas, they'll get shot down by someone saying, well, why should we listen to this guy? He doesn't have a competition track record, right? I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't compete. He's never won worlds. Why should we listen to him? Which is a a total fallacy, right? So I'm, I'm hoping that as an art, we can move away from that and teaching can just be part of the learning process, right? And we don't look at it as this like guru on the mountain degree of expertise. Yeah, that's right. I used to get that a lot when I first started instruction, especially after my first series that I did, which was around a very specific grip called a reverse Kimura. And a lot of people would would look at just like a single one-off technique video that I would take out of the series and they'd be like, yeah, right, try that on Buchecha. I'm like, guys, Jiu-jitsu doesn't work on Buchecha. What what does that mean? You know, like like what a stupid level to to try to aspire to just for a like come on guys, you you got to be more realistic. And and like you're saying there's a value in instruction which is completely separate from the athletic value. Mm-hmm. And they don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. Like you can be a great athlete and a great instructor, but again, they don't have to coexist either. And you can find great athletes that are horrible instructors and great instructors that are not great at athletic, you know, competitors. And if look, if your goal is to learn jujitsu and you find somebody who's awesome at teaching that, I mean, problem solved. There you go. And I, I just want to go out there and say that I thank you, Steve, to uh, allowing me to come on here because I don't have like a robust competition career, but I, I feel like I've got value to add to the community, which is important to me to give back. This is part of what makes it so rewarding to me is to see the value that people are getting from it through the videos that I put up on my page. Oh, and, and if you guys want to check out, like I've got a ton of videos up on on my personal Instagram, Drew.Weatherhead, that you can just, you know, you can sample my teaching style and and see what I'm up to. But also just like it's it's so important that we don't mute these conversations mm-hmm. based off of off of these arbitrary credentials. You know what I mean? And so again, thank you for letting me come on here doing this. It's I've had a lot of fun talking about all of these ideas. I had pages of notes. I think we got through them all. Hopefully it, it came across well, but uh, I would be happy to answer any, any questions if people want to message me in the future. And uh, yeah, I've got, I've got lots of other stuff out there. If you want to check me out, I've got a, um, a full member site with over 500 videos on there right now. That is uh, drewjitsuonline.com. You can check out my personal made instructionals at because-jitsu.com. And I've got stuff on BJJ Fanatics as well as Jiu-Jitsu X if you want to check them out. Awesome. Yeah, it's been really cool to see the proliferation of your ideas in the last few months, especially. I mean, I've noticed that you've been out there on all of these platforms, and I think it's fantastic. And I mean, it's funny, this is something I want to one day maybe do a whole dedicated episode on, which is this thing. um, I've been looking into it. They call it the permission paradox, which is that like, Hmm. it's the old catch 22 thing of you can't do this because you don't have experience, but you can't get experience until you've done it, right? right? It's like how, you know, if you apply for a job, you know, they'll say, oh, well, you you can't have it because you don't have the experience. And it's like, well, motherfucker, I can, I'll never get the experience yep. unless someone gives me the opportunity. And it's kind of a... It's, it's a natural and understandable way that humans act because of course we want to, we want to guard our minds from just random noise. And that's a good practice to have. But I, I have found th- th- it to be quite amusing that when I started... BJJ Mental Models, I did get that feedback as well. I mean, in the early days, I got a lot of like, why should we listen to you? You should shut this down and just not do this. But it's funny, after you get to like 100 episodes, and now, you know, you've got like Lachlan Giles and all, you know, Travis Stevens and all of the, and John Thomas and all of these guys on the podcast, and we're all sharing ideas. Now, suddenly, apparently, I'm like a fucking expert. I mean, I've (laughs) I've literally never competed in my life. I'm a total 
couch bent hobbyist. Like I, I oh, am that's the absolute, fascinating. Yeah, I, my my competition record. I always like to joke is zero zero and zero, which technically means I have a more winning record than Carlos Gracie yeah, Senior. No losses, <laughs> no ties. <laughs> yeah. I, I am technically undefeated, which is more than you can say for Carlos Gracie Senior. But it, it's just funny because by virtue of the fact that now I've been doing this long enough and people are used to seeing my name, suddenly I'm an expert, and mm. I'll get these like literally world class competitors wanting to brain storm with me or get my advice on something. And it's like, why are you asking me what you're going to do at Worlds? Like, I, I've i never even been to Worlds as a spectator and you're, mm-hmm. you're asking me what to do when I'm on the mats. But I have that reputation now just by virtue of the fact that if you do it long enough, eventually you overcome that permission paradox and then suddenly people will accept you. So I'm I'm glad to see the, the explosion of Drew-based content out there. I'm really happy for that. And just to maybe repeat that again, if people want to check out your sub site, I mean, I know that that's the big driver for what you want to do going forward. How can they find that? Yeah. So my main focus right now is in these technique instructionals that are on my member site, which is, it's only $14.99 a month. It's actually less than industry standard just because I want to get people in here to enjoy it. I've got over 500 videos and all sorts of different topics that are easily searchable on there. And you can get a week free just by signing up to check it out. And if you don't want to throw your credit card in there right away and you want to see what it's actually, what, what these techniques look like, like I said, they're up, a lot of them are up on on my Instagram, my personal one, Drew.Weatherhead on Instagram. I have like, I don't know, like 60 or 70 videos up there that'll give you a really good example of what you'll find on the site because they're taken directly from it. It's DrewJitsuOnline.com. I keep saying the site. <laughs> awesome. And just to clarify, I mean, it'll be in the show notes, but it's D-R-E-W, right? Correct. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. And of course, for the rest of us, I mean, I think all of our listeners know, but BJJ Mental Models is powered by our subscribers on Patreon. The premium BJJ Mental Models stuff is available there. We've got a bunch of different tiers depending on your financial commitment and your level of interest and what you're looking for. I mean, at the cheapest, you can get on there for the price of a cup of coffee for a month, which is probably one of the best values you'll get. Among other things, that'll get you early access to our episodes and access to our awesome uh, Discord community. Community, growing every day. I think there's all, I think there's over 25 black belts in there now. So yeah, if you, including Drew and myself. So if mm-hmm. you want to chat with us and brainstorm and drop your ideas, you can get in there. That's also where we do uh, narrated technique reviews for our subscribers. So if you want to hop onto our Patreon, you can send us your videos. I'd be happy to to break them down and to put them in front of the group and just demonstrate how a lot of these ideas we talk about on the show map back in action to what you're actually doing. Please do consider it if you haven't already. Again, you can get get it as cheap as a cup of coffee, which is probably the best deal you'll get. Patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. I'd really appreciate it if you at least check it out. That's how we keep the lights on here and how we keep it ad free and we keep things going. So Drew, amazing chat. I really love this topic of kind of the journey of just like the journey into the meta really of becoming an instructor. I think it's something that a lot of people don't think about until it's too late and they find themselves on the other side of the room and it's like, oh shit, now I've got to learn how to teach. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, but really the art of thinking of yourself as a teacher is actually, in my opinion, one of the best ways that you can make yourself better as a student as well. So Mm -hmm. I sort of encourage everyone to take on the mindset of a teacher, even from a young age in jujitsu, even before you really have any right to technically be teaching the class, to try to think of things from the other side of the coin and how you would teach and present this information will only make you a better grappler. Well, Drew, thanks again so much for joining us. I really appreciate this conversation. And yeah, I do hope that everyone checks out your your service because I'm sure that it's, it's absolutely fascinating if this conversation was any indication. I really do appreciate the time. And yeah, of course, you can always be checked out as well on Because Jitsu. If you're familiar with the most popular meme site on the internet, you can just understand and know that it's actually Drew who's behind that. Yeah, thanks, Steve. It's been a pleasure. And like I said, we can do another podcast talking about that whole memeology thing, too. It's a it's a whole different thing. Well, I I do find that an interesting topic of conversation because I mean we like to we like to disparage memes as like lowbrow communication, but how dare I, yeah, but but and I mean some of that is surely true, but I think the flip side of that is it's it's really a great example of efficiency of words in action, right? Yeah, making something sticky with minimal words and minimal content is actually a powerful strategy for transmitting ideas. 
end for teaching, right? You talked earlier about efficiency of words. You can apply those same strategies to trying to persuade people. And, you know, I think that memes, yes, a lot of the time they'd get transmitted around because they're funny, but they can also be an extraordinarily powerful tool of education, which is the mm-hmm. way that I, you know, on, on our Instagram, that's how we normally use them. And so there's no rule saying that they have to just be jokes. But anyway, really appreciate you coming by, Drew. And of course, we appreciate everyone spending the time listening to us. Thanks a lot for participating in this conversation, Drew, and to all of the people in the community. And we'll talk to you guys next time. 